Tom and Paul show because I couldn't think of anything better. That shows you my creativity in this case. But you know what? Tom McNear is a great guy and I'm happy to have him on as my co-presenter here. So first business item is uh, we're doing this as kind of a celebration of hitting the 1,000 member mark in the Remote Viewing and Remote Perception Facebook group. This is a private group that I'm, I sponsor, but I have a lot of great people helping out and a lot of great members joining. And uh, we hit this mark about three weeks ago, I think. And we're already up to one with 1,400. So we'll maybe have uh, 2,000 before we even get done with this presentation. Who knows? Anyway, uh, I'd like to encourage anybody who isn't a member who's just guesting on this little broadcast uh, to join this. You don't have to leave any other group to do it. Uh, each of those groups has their own virtues and, and value. Um, this one, it, we've kept it private because we want it to be very remote viewing centric. Um, a lot of the other, the other groups out there um, are more open to other things uh, that may circle around the periphery of remote viewing. We're just trying to keep this a very kind of a, I hate to use this word, but safe space for remote viewing discussion. And if any posts are offered that stray too far from this idea of, from the concepts of behind remote viewing, then we won't uh, admit those. It's not a personal thing, but we're just trying to keep this very remote viewing focused. Okay. So um, I think Russell's going to put the, uh, the join link in the uh, chat every now and again, so you can join up if you want. Um, it's just a recommendation. Okay. Second business item. So I announced a week or so ago a initiative that we've been, I and a few people behind the scenes have been discussing and working on. Um, I had some students who uh, wanted to help other people who had remote viewing promise who showed that they could be become excellent remote viewers um, and have a real passion for the field may have some struggles financially or whatever to sign on to be able to take my courses. So these students unbidden, I didn't ask them to do this, um, contributed substantial sum of money that we can use to help defray the tuition expenses of people who wanna take the class. I kind of meet them halfway. I also decrease the full tuition fee for these folks in kind of commensurate to what they're, they, um, scholarship offers so that we can kind of uh, help new people who look like they could really turn into good remote viewers get involved in this. Um, and so this was announced last week. We called it the Ingo Swan uh, Scholarship, but talking to Ingo's estate, um, we came up with an actual better term for this. There's a Ingo Swan Fellowship that the uh, University of Western Georgia offers, and we felt like the name was a little too close to that. So we've come up with this, the Ingo Swan CRV Legacy Scholarship. The goal here is to preserve the original Ingo Swan uh, CRV protocols, as close as they can be preserved, uh, into future generations. Now, there's a lot of debate about methodologies out there. There's lots of different ways of doing remote viewing although the majority of them are in some way descendants of the original Ingo, Ingo Swan CRV. And everyone's free. I, I don't condemn anyone for using a different methodology. Uh, anyone's free to try whatever they want, but I want to make sure that Ingo's version actually gets preserved as, he, as we were taught it, Tom and me and, and some of the others as well. Um, I don't know if they're here. I don't know if Bill showed up or not. Um, but uh, so this scholarship is there and that's why we call it the CRV Legacy Scholarship for Ingo Swan. And uh, Ingo's estate is fully on board with this approach. So we are going to, as our first item of business, announce our first ever recipient of the Ingo Swan CRV Legacy Scholarship. And here we go. Recipient of the first ever scholarship is David Powell. Now, uh, many of you have probably seen him on the list. You'll know that he's passionate about remote viewing. He posts a lot. He does a lot of work behind the scenes, practicing and learning. Um, Russell Pickering has been quite a uh, consistent mentor to David, and they've uh, been able to do some good work. And David's 
made a huge amount of progress. And so I want to congratulate him on the work he's always already done. And this gives him, gives him an opportunity to move further into this field. Now, let me tell you a little bit about him. He grew up and worked in Chicago. He was a Chicago union electrician for 20 years. He now lives in Florida. He has a wife and two kids. Uh, he didn't say anything about, uh, about pets. Maybe he has some. Um, he says he started reading about remote viewing about three and a half years ago, found a particular interest and passion for CRV, and he says he hasn't looked back. Well, this will pull him even further down that rabbit hole, and I hope he finds it to be a really good journal, journey. At any rate, congratulations, congratulations, David. He's on with us today. Um, I don't know. Shall I give him 30 seconds, Russell, to talk about it? Put him on the spot? Maybe 25. All right, David, do you want to take 25 seconds and just say some a few words? I just want to, want to thank you so much for the opportunity and let everybody know um, that, you know, Paul is very generous. I, I, I first bumped into Paul on Facebook. I was completely shocked that he was on there. Uh, it was just a, a big surprise. And um, he's been very kind to me the last few years, helping me along. Russell's been an unbelievably uh, just a tremendous amount of help donated a lot of his time um so i'm just excited to get started and 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 use this for something positive just amazing amazing uh thing to be involved in thank excellent. you excellent well congratulations david and just to let you know my wife is surprised to find me on facebook too but but <laughs> that's a different matter okay oh can i throw one thing in here regarding david okay um be nice now. <laughs> what? No, that's no fun. Um, David has worked incredibly hard, asked great questions, read every uh, assignment, Tom's manual, the final CRV manual, responded elegantly to correction. His stage one through three structure has come into great form. His sessions are becoming more accurate. And I can only tell you, for those of you that are not aware how hard he's worked behind the scenes, he absolutely deserves this. He's earned it. And uh, I'm very proud of you, David. Excellent. Okay, good. Just briefly, I want to introduce Tom McNair. Now, many of you know who he is. Tom and I met for the first time uh, in May of 1983 when I was assigned to Fort Meade and we moved in right across the street from him. We had kids roughly the same age. We found that we had a lot of similar interests. We found that we really had a kind of a, uh, what's the word, simpatico, I guess, kind of a relationship with each other. Um, we had uh, dinners at each other's houses. We had lots of fun together. And Tom was an interesting guy to be living on a military installation because he had a full beard, not as gray as it is in this picture. By the way, this photo was taken Tom was one of the main presenters at Ingo Swan's uh, memorial in New York City not long after Ingo passed away. Um, and Tom always wore civilian clothes. Uh, and I'm really puzzled because everybody else on Fort Meade that was in the military was in uniform and did not have a beard. <laughs> and so I kept kind of bugging him about it. And what, what do you guys do? And Skip, Skip Atwater lived across the street, didn't have the beard, but otherwise was pretty much like Tom. And they said, well, you know, the standard, we can't tell you. And I'm, I'm really puzzled because here we are in Fort Meade, one of the, the most uh, secure uh, installations uh, around because the NSA was there. And we all had ultra high clearances and all that. And yet they couldn't tell me. They couldn't even tell me what kind of intelligence work they did. Well, I soon found out and I'll uh, probably have an opportunity to talk about that later. But Tom, uh, he was at the time a captain like me, and uh, we spent uh, several years together in the, fort, in the uh, remote viewing program. And then he went back to his original specialty, which was counterintelligence. He worked uh, a lot in Europe, spent a lot of years in Europe. Uh, at one time, he and Bill Ray, who was also a counterintelligence uh, specialist, uh, worked together, although not in the same organization. Uh, and, um, he ultimately retired as lieutenant colonel. 
Then Wart went back to work for the government, keeping the world safe for democracy and uh, and doing lots of good things. And uh, he's just overall got a, had a fascinating life, fascinating career. When I knew him, his side uh, hobby was picture framing. He made professional picture frames in his basement. And wonderful job. Uh, he had other also made wooden boats. He made wooden boat models. He just and they were gorgeous. He's such got a such an attention to detail that that anything he does comes out exquisitely. So anyway, um, once he retired, he got reacquainted with Ingo. In fact, here's a picture of him and Ingo uh, working together, doing a remote viewing session with Ingo's stunning painting Millennium behind them. And, uh, and kind of the rest is history. Thomas slowly becoming more and more a figure in the remote viewing community. And now we have an opportunity here for him to, um, to tell us more of what he knows to our enlightenment and education. Uh, by the way, here is a photo. Some of you have seen this one as well. Back in the day, this is Tom. He didn't have a beard in this picture. What am your beard, Tom? Well, whatever. Um, and this is uh, Bill Ray. And this is me, Ed Dames, Ingo Swan, and Charlene Schufelt. Okay. Kavanaugh at the time. And then she married a general. Uh, and became Schufelt. So anyway, that's probably as good an introduction as Tom needs, except for this one thing I almost forgot. You've heard this before probably, but Ringo regarded, regarded Tom as being his best ever uh, CRV and, and remote viewing student. And if you see some of Tom's fabulous remote viewing work, you'll understand why Ingo said that. They became fast friends and, and interacted a lot even after um, Ingo was shut out of the program because of bureaucratic infighting um, and, uh, and all that went with that. So anyway, with that, I think maybe the best place to start would be to, for you to just kind of tell us how you got involved in this remote viewing stuff in the first place. Great, well, thanks for the introduction, Paul. I hope I can stand up to the scrutiny. Um, Rob Cowart, and you guys, well, I'll show you a picture of him in a while, and you'll hear his name frequently, and I were in the Military Intelligence Officers Advanced Course at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and the day was winding down. Incidentally, that's a, that's one of Ingo's paintings in the background there. That was a gift from the estate to me. And interestingly enough, it's not completed. So I imagine myself helping him finish it off one of these days. But Rob and I were in the Military Intelligence Officers Advanced Force at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And the day was winding down and in came somebody named Lieutenant Fred Atwater. Most of you know him as Skip. And he and Scotty Watt walked in the door and they said, oh, before you guys go home, we have this psychological survey we would like you all to take. And you don't even have to put your names on your paper. We just wanna find out what the typical military intelligence officer psychological profile would be. And so we all took these forms. There are 14 questions and we answered the questions and dropped them off and headed out for the day. Unbeknownst to us, Skip Atwater was writing our names on the paper at the time we were turning them in. So we didn't think much of it until the next morning when Rob and I were called out of class and Rob had scored 11 out of 14, which they considered to be exceptionally well. And I had scored 14 out of 14. So what was a survey? Well, it was a survey of questions that they thought indicated a predisposition of being a good remote viewer. And um, it was sort of an iffy questionnaire and I don't think it was ever used after that. But we were read on, we were told that there was such a program as the remote viewing program and we were asked if we wanted to join. Well, who could say no to something like that? So of course, Rob and I both accepted those positions. 
And it was not easy um, because we both had follow on assignments already lined up. So that had to get turned off before the assignment to Fort Meade to the remote viewing program could get turned on. But um, eventually at the last minute, they finally decided let me out of my other assignment, let me go to Fort Meade. And they, we couldn't tell any of them why I had to go to Fort Meade. But I ended up being um, one of the very first in the remote viewing program, it was called Grill Flame at the time. And then shortly after that, it was changed to Center Lane and then the name changed numerous times. But that's how I got into what most of you know is the Stargate program. But I think you'll find interesting, Paul, why don't you tell them how you got into the program? Well, I'd love to do that, but I was thinking first, I'd like to ask you a question. How did you personally feel when you first walked into those office spaces about being involved in that project? When I first walked in at Fort Meade? Yeah. Or Well, there's actually two time points. First one is when you found out about this, and the second time is when you first began, You first, the first day you walked in, I guess. Well, my dad was a scientist for NASA, and he and I used to talk about lots of esoteric things, and one of them was things psychic. Now, we never went into great detail about it because he was more a concrete materialist scientist, but um, when I found out that there was such a program, I was fascinated by the concept, and actually... I believe I thought I was going to go there to assist the program, not necessarily to become one of the psychics, one of the remote viewers. But when I got there, I found out, yes, you're going to be one of the remote viewers. That's why we gave you the test and that's why we invited you here. So there was a little trepidation there, a little nervousness. And about this time, Skip Atwater was sent to the advanced course where Rob and I came from. So we didn't go Im immediately to train with Ingo Swan. Um, we did some of our own remote viewing and we used the, the outbounder process. So mine, for instance, before I ever met Ingo Swan, my first opportunity to remote view was ERV, what most of you know that Joe does today. So Joe McMonigle and Rob were my outbounders. And I went over to the operational room and uh, I relaxed on the bed that we had in there. And Skip was still there at this time. Skip came in and says, okay, Tom, they are at the site describe your perceptions. And I described my perceptions. I talked about, you know, they're walking down a hallway, they're looking out the window. This is what it looks like outside the window. And I, I uh, drew pictures of that. I said, there's a park bench there and they're sitting on the park bench talking. And, you know, a little bit more. And then Skip said, okay, Tom, they're leaving the site now. So bring your perceptions back into the room. Well, as I said, my father was a scientist. He taught me to never believe anything unless you've experienced it yourself. So before coming back into the remote viewing room, so to speak, I said to myself, I want to know one thing at that site that will confirm to me beyond any doubt that I was actually there. And I saw a spiral staircase. So, I brought my perceptions back into the room. Skip and I leave the building just about the time Joe and Rob are pulling up. So we all pile into the car and we take off to go see where it was that I just remote viewed. And we drove past an, a retirement center. And as we drove by it, they said that I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I, stared at it and you know they were all chuckling in the car and I didn't know what they were chuckling yeah. about. 
but I wasn't even aware that I was staring at this site. So they turned around and pulled into it and they said, this is the site. And did you know you were just staring at it? And I, I was unaware, but we went in and Joe McMonagle took me through the tour. He says, okay, we walked down this hall. We looked out this window. Here's a park bench. We sat on this park bench and chatted for a while. And then we left. Well, no spiral staircase. So as we were leaving, there were double doors to the right side of the hall that we didn't go into. And I asked Joe, what's in that room? And he said, well, I really don't know. He said, um, we peeked in there, but there was a meeting going on and we didn't want to interrupt. So we didn't go in. So I said, well, can we go in there now? And Joe said, sure. So we went in and this room was the multi-purpose room for the retirement community. And on one end of it was a stage. And in the middle of that stage was a spiral staircase that was being used as one of the props in the play. It was actually one that people could walk up and down. So for me, that was that concrete evidence that I was there. And more importantly to me, Joe and Rob never went into that room. So they weren't sending telepathy or something back to me telling me about this spiral staircase. I knew that spiral staircase was in, in a room that neither of them had gone into. So that was my first remote viewing before I learned CRV. And um, it just got more interesting from there. Okay, yeah, so you asked how did I get involved? And actually it's probably an interesting contrast because my, in some ways my uh, introduction to the program was a contrast to yours. In some ways there were some similarities. Um, so I had just come back from Germany. I'd gone to the, the advanced course like you were talking about having done. Um, and then I got assigned to Fort Meade kind of as a second thought there. Um, I had actually, my, my then wife wanted to go to a social work graduate school. So she uh, found out that not far from Fort Meade was, was the uh, Catholic University graduate program in social work. And so she talked me into seeing if we could go to Fort Meade. And it turned out a better choice. I was looking at Arlington Hall station which is kind of downtown Virginia suburb DC and it would have been a nightmare living down there. Fort Meade was a gorgeous place to live if you had to live in the DC area. It was very almost pastoral. So okay so I get assigned there um, after the advanced course and I show up and I'm there to be a Mideast linguist and not a linguist, a Mideast analyst. So uh, processing Iranian and, and, uh, and Iraqi and those kinds of reports and passing them out to the various people who needed access to them. And so uh, I move into this little housing community um, across the street from Skip Atwater. And I've kind of told you that I didn't know what they were doing and I was very curious about it. And one day they asked me to, uh, they said, you might be good at what we do. And I said, what do you do? And they said, we can't tell you. And I said, how do, how do you, I know I want to volunteer for something. I don't know what it is. And they said, well, that's all right. We'll, we'll let you know in, in, the, in the right time. And I, I've told this story before, so I'm going to try and shorten it up a little bit. So it all boiled down to me going over to these buildings that were just really kind of dilapidated. They dated from World War II. They meant to been meant to be tem temporary back then. But I walk in the door and there's computers and there's people and there's all this stuff. And Tom was the one who read me on. He takes me to the back. He sits me down. He gives me this non-disclosure agreement uh, in in lay terms. The military calls it something different, but uh, a non-disclosure agreement that was probably the most strict one I had ever had to sign in the military, even for top secret in, uh, information. So um, I, I sign it and then Tom says, well, what we do is collect intelligence against foreign threats using a parapsychology, parapsychology discipline called remote viewing. Essentially, we would like you to volunteer to become a psychic spy. And, um, and I, I thought about it as soon as I heard parapsychology and remote viewing, and, and he started to go on saying, well, you don't have to tell us, you don't have to make your decision until tomorrow, you can tell us tomorrow. You, uh, here's some things you can tell your wife because they found out you need to tell your spouse something because this was a major career change. 
And I said, when he finished up with that, I said, I don't need any time at all. I want to do it. And I don't know if he remembers that, but he kind of had a look of surprise on his face. And uh, because nobody else had said yeah, right away, as far as I know, no one else had ever said right away immediately without even thinking about it. Yes, I want to do it. I was so surprised that you were willing to throw your military career away <laughs> on the spur of the moment like that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, because I had had an ongoing interest in ESP for a long time, read a lot of science fiction about it, read a lot of books. I even read some Ed Edgar Cayce, some J.B. Ryan and that. Um, been involved in a science fair project that had failed involving ESP. So I kind of come to doubt that it was real. And then all of a sudden, Tom is telling me Congress is paying for a program that actually did this. And that was very strong confirmation that there was something to it. So there was no way I was not going to do it. Even if I didn't make it past captain, I was going to do it. And so uh, there we go. You know, it was, and it was a great, uh, a great uh, experience. Now, on the other hand, it actually did cost me my military career. You'll hear people out there saying, Oh, being in the remote viewing program was a kiss of death. You know, once you're in that, you never go anywhere else. Well, Tom's a good counterexample of that. He made it all the way to lieutenant colonel and had a full career. Um, uh, Joe McMoneagle, who sometimes says that, he actually had been promoted to chief warrant officer three, but turned it down because he wanted to retire. Lynn Buchanan will say uh, he being in the program was what kept him from being retired, uh, being uh, promoted. But no, he also was on the list for E8 for master sergeant, but in order to uh, stay at the program, he turned that promotion down too, because he had to go, in order to go take a, take, accept that rank, he had to go to a position that supported it. And we didn't have any, uh, at the time, any E8 openings at Fort Meade's or at the, in the remote viewing unit. So in my case, it actually was the problem, but it wasn't because I was a remote viewer, it's because I spent seven years in the program. During the time I should have had a company command to get promoted. And I never had a company command as a captain. And when it came time for the Lieutenant Colonel board, essentially I was dead in the water. I had, you know, great uh, officer efficiency reports from wartime, from Desert Storm, all that stuff. And they said, if you'd had a company command, you got to promote it. But because you didn't have that, there was not a chance they were going to make Lieutenant Colonel. So it wasn't being a remote viewer that did it in. It was being in the remote viewing program for too long that did me in career-wise, but that's fine. I got to retire as a major. That's, there's no complaints there. So anyway, <clears throat> I went off on a tangent there. Sorry about that. So I actually want to come back to you, Tom, and, and ask you, uh, maybe you can kind of give us a, uh, a description of what it was like, actually, the actual training process was like to interact with Ingo and have him as your instructor. How, how did that feel? How did it look? What were your concerns about it? What was great about it? All that kind of stuff. Anything you want to tell right. us about that? Well, let me share my screen, Russell, if you would. What was it like? Well, as I said, Rob Cowart and I um, were selected to go, and we were the first two to be trained by Ingo. And I like to mention Rob Cowart as much as I can, because um, Rob and I started training with Ingo in 1982. Most of our training took place at SRI in Menlo Park, California. But after the third iteration of training, um, Rob was diagnosed with cancer and was medically retired from the Army. So he gets forgotten a lot from the remote viewing historical record, and he's no longer with us. But there's a picture of Rob Coward. Um, the little girl in the middle is my daughter, and we used to get everybody in the neighborhood on my daughter's birthdays to act out some sort of a play. So there's Rob Coward as the grandmother, and that handsome hunter, that's me. And that's Rob Coward. Now, now that I've embarrassed Rob, sorry, Rob, um, I have to embarrass Joe McMonigle too. So there's Joe McMonigle the next year where, when we were portraying Goldilocks and the Three Bears. He was Papa Bear. And those attractive legs you see there belong to Mama Bear. 
So Rob and I went to Menlo Park, California and met Ingo for the first time. And there's sort of a funny story about that. Ingo came out, he was dressed in a, a jacket and tie and blue jeans and cowboy boots. And on the, the flight out there, Rob and I talked to one another and we admitted we were a little bit nervous about meeting the great psychic Ingo Swan. You know, could he read our minds? Would we get along with one another? And we met him and he was dressed in a jacket and tie and you know, we started our training and we got along famously. But about 20 or 25 years later, Ingo confided in me that he was using his terms scared shitless about that first meeting with Rob and me. He said he had no idea what to expect from career military officers. He didn't know if we'd get along, you know, that sort of thing. So he said that's why he wore that jacket and tie. But that was the once and only time, the whole time I knew Ingo, which I knew him all the way until 2013 when he passed away. That was the only time I ever saw him in a jacket and tie. So we went out and trained with Ingo, typically two weeks in California, two weeks back at Fort Meade to practice what we learned two weeks in California and back. We did that after Rob was medically retired, then it was just Ingo and me for pretty much the next three years. Now, Ingo was an excellent trainer and mentor. Now, I know many of you have met him and there are two sides to Ingo and I know that Paul knows exactly what <laughs> I'm talking about. Those who only know Ingo a little bit, he's an extremely nice guy. But to those who have been around to see the other side, he can be demanding and a little difficult to get along with. And that's the way he was sometimes in his training. And that's because it was so important to him. This was his legacy. This was his chance to share with subsequent generations how to remote view. And so um, one of the things that we always did was we ended on a high. Sometimes we would start at 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning, and I may do an especially good remote viewing session, and that would be it for the day. We would take off for the rest of the day because he wanted to always end on that high instead of driving the, the signal line away and ending on a failure. So once we ended for the day, we end up hanging out together for the rest of the day. He liked to go to good restaurants. He liked to go to the movies. So those were the sorts of things that we did. Um, he was my mentor and he was my monitor. So for my entire training, it was Ingo sitting at the other end of the table from me. And there's one sort of an interesting story about that. You know, the monitor's job is to sit quietly, watch the remote viewer. When the remote viewer puts pen on paper, that's their cue that they're supposed to read the coordinate. And other than that, they shouldn't say anything. Well, one time I was sitting at the end of the table with my pen in the air. And I guess I was sitting there for a while and Ingo quietly whispered to me, you wanna take the coordinate again? And in mock anger, I looked at him and said, I'm the viewer here, you're the monitor. You sit quietly at the end of the table when I put my pen on the paper, that's your time to talk. But until then, you sit quietly and say nothing. And he sat at the end of the table, just beaming, because that's what he wanted in a remote viewer. He wanted the remote viewer to always know that even if it was the greatest psychic in the world sitting at the other end of the table, the remote viewer was always in charge. And so that was my, uh, my humorous 
story with him as my monitor. But he could be a demanding trainer um, because again, it, this was important to him. He constantly talked about the psychic renaissance. He believed that once enough of us were able to do this, then we would all recognize it and we could all do it. And that was his goal. What do you have, Paul? So, okay, that sounds good. Um, so obviously this training, whoops, am I, oh yeah, my camera's up too. Uh, obviously this training was very personal and I'm a little bit jealous because even though every session I did with us, with the SRA training program, Inga was my monitor. I had to share him with three other people. So I didn't get that one-on-one -on -one time, but we still, of course, had plenty of, uh, of social interaction. We did movies. In fact, uh, I don't know if you're along. We did when the Terminator was first released, Inga was dead eager to go see that show. <laughs> and so we all troop over there with him to a theater there in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, it was awesome. <laughs> it was really awesome. So uh, we saw a bunch of movies that way. So we had a lot of these social interactions, but I'm guessing that your, um, the actual training process was similar to ours. Um, in that Ingo was a stickler for note-taking. He absolutely insisted on, on you taking notes, on the students taking notes. He had us write essays. Did, did he have you guys write essays? Absolutely. The first thing he did was issued us each our, dic our own dictionary. Yes. I'm sure he did the same with you. Yes. And he would stop throughout the lectures and say, I just used a particular word. What does that mean? And we would all literally look it up in the dictionary and agree upon which of the three or four possible definitions he meant. He said that uh, words were mind traps and we needed to all understand that when we used a particular word, we all meant the exact same thing. After a lecture, we would have to then write an essay that showed that we understood what he taught us. And only if we passed the essay would we then go into the viewing room and start remote viewing on the stages that he had just taught us? Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and it could be very um, fatiguing. It could be very fatiguing. Uh, but it was compensated for when we had the quit on the high thing. You could oftentimes get a lot of rest time after that. It was a great way to spend... Uh, taxpayers money at least from my perspective <laughs> so <clears throat> but it was uh, it was challenging and thrilling and exciting and and intimidating uh, all at the same time and Ingo he wasn't quite as quiet in my sessions he was sometimes well well the thing about Ingo was he had these uh these uh non-verbal kind of tells as well he always had a pencil with him and if he was upset with something you did he'd start tapping that eraser on the on the table and you'd have to figure out what it was that he, <laughs> that he didn't like so anyway did you yeah. allow him to smoke his cigars while you were viewing you know um i do not have a recollection i have this vague recollection of him smoking and then i have vague recollection of his not smoking i couldn't tell you at the moment uh i don't i never really paid much attention yeah. to that of course it's he and true. i came to an agreement right up front yeah now he had an ashtray with about six snuffed out cigars in there that always stank. But, but um, he and I agreed that he wouldn't smoke while I was viewing. <laughs> well, apparently it didn't, didn't uh, if he was doing it, it didn't bother me that much. But yeah. I also not sure that I would have had the courage to stand up to him in that situation and say, stop that, you know, or whatever. Um, well, but... It's My awesome. training went through stage six and we started developing stage seven. Mm -hmm. And about that time is when you and Bill and Charlene and Ed came on and you were do, doing your training mm -hmm. and Ingo's contract with the army ended about that time. I had just finished stage six. You guys were up to about stage three. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you see here. Um, I told you that 
most of my training was done in Menlo Park, California, but my last few times of training was done in New York City at the SRI offices there. And that's where Paul and, and everyone else received their training. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see this picture here of all of us assembled in Ingo's studio in New York. Now, Paul, the next slide you haven't seen before, but for everybody else. Oh my goodness. Yeah, this, my kids knew Ingo as Uncle Ingo because we, Ingo and I remained friends right up until his passing. And this was one of the times when Paul's family and my family happened to have been at Ingo's at the same time. And so the red writing, James, Christopher, and Mary are Paul's children. And the blue writing, Catherine, Aaron, and Carrie are my kids. But you notice this picture and the last were both taken in front of the same painting. And I want you to see that for those of you who haven't seen it, this is called Millennium by Ingo Swan. I actually watched him finish some of that. He worked on that over a number of years. It's on display at the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. And it's a triptych that's eight feet high and 24 feet long. And if you're ever anywhere near Baltimore, Maryland, I strongly encourage you to go see it. It is amazing. You know, and, and it's interesting. Um, that's another thing you and I have in common, Tom, that both of us had some little participation as he's finishing that up. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually helped him put the, uh, the varnish coat on it, which is the last thing you do on a painting, right? Put the varnish coat on. He didn't allow me to touch it, but he had me help lay it. Had me help him lay it down, and, <laughs> and and then he'd brush the varnish on and stuff, you know. And then you know whatever, all of that stuff. But the one memory I have of that is before that. I think it was maybe a day or two before. There was something he wanted to fix on something. It wasn't quite right, and so I'm down there, and he's got his paints out. He used oils on this. He paints and his brush, and he's and he's got it, and he's doing some stuff on it. And I'm just there in total horror because he was drunker than heck. <laughs> he was doing it. And I was afraid he's going to ruin the whole thing, you know. But interestingly, even drunk, he it was very precise in where he put the paint, paint, and it turned out fine. He obsessed with the little tiny stars that you see me circling. And I can imagine that's what he was doctoring up when he was with you. Yeah, I think it probably was one of those, actually. Yeah. I, I thought it was fine. I didn't see why he felt like it needed something else, but but he did. So anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. So this is a picture of Ingo and I, the fall of 2012. This is just months before his passing, sitting on the stoop in front of his loft in New York City. Um, his health was not good at that time, but... Anybody who knew him misses him. Yeah, indeed. And I'll turn it back to you, Paul. Okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> it, thanks, thanks for taking me back, Tom. <laughs> so um, so the, the main purpose of this, of course, is to talk about the manuals uh, or what we're calling manuals for want of a better term to describe what these things are. And the first really significant thing was, uh, was the one you wrote, Tom. Now, set a little background. Um, Ingo never, um, well, I won't say never. He never formally documented any of the CRV stuff. There's a ton of notes. Um, but mostly, I think most of it lives on in his student notes. And so um, these two things we're going to talk about Tom's manual, and notice it doesn't say manual on the cover here, but that's the best way to describe it. I don't know how else to describe it. And mine really were an attempt to codify what Ingo had taught us as strictly and as in as much detail as possible, because that was really the only documentation we were going to get out of this. So Tom, what I'd like you to do is tell us, first of all, what motivated you to create this in the first place? 
and then maybe talk about the process by which you by which you created it and developed it. All right. Well, again, the contract ended with Ingo. I knew through stage six slash seven. Um, Paul and crew knew through stage three, and we didn't want that to be lost. So I was asked to sit down and write the training that I had received from Ingo. And this is what I wrote. Um, I tried to capture it exactly as Ingo taught using Ingo's words. And for those of you who haven't seen a copy of it, the, the link below is on that slide. You can go, down, go out to the CIA Freedom of Information Act website and you can download it for yourself. And this is what you'll see. But the CIA had a bad habit of highlighting things with black marker. <laughs> so you can't see what's under that little box. But if that box wasn't there, there's what it really said. So there's what the cover actually looked like. Now I was actually tasked with capturing Ingo's training stages one through six because it wasn't long after I finished this and after I finished the training that I went off and continued my career in military intelligence. And I left this behind um, for those who came behind me, especially for stages four, five, and six, which they didn't get directly from Ingo. And in this, I hypothesized what might come after stage six. And if you'll bear with me, I'll go ahead and show you that right now. So in chapter 10, what you see on the right is the actual document that I wrote. And on the left is um, a little easier to read. But we now know today that stage seven is phonetics. But if you'll notice on the right, I have stage eight is phonetics. And that's because just as I was finishing training, stage seven started presenting themselves. And Ingo was saying, yeah, yeah, I expected those, but I expected them more after analytics. So, you know, we were a little confused as to what was stage seven, what was stage eight. So now we know that stage seven is phonetics and stage eight is analytic. But stage seven is phonetics. It's naming things. It's names of persons, places, or things associated with the sites that come out. You hear the sounds in your mind or you find your mouth trying to say these sounds. And I won't go into it much more than that because I'm working on a presentation right now on discovering stage seven. And I went back and I have some of Ingo Swan's own training materials where he was teaching himself with how put off being his monitor. And I have some of Paul's stage sevens as well. So that's going to be an interesting presentation. I'm getting really excited as I produce it. I think, let and me jump in real quick, Tom. I think that's going to be a really great thing. So um, I'm, I'm eager to see that full presentation once it's available. So, uh, or, I mean, you can even attend Marty's thing. I, you know, I, I recommend that you, uh, you do it, do whatever you need to, to listen to Tom's presentation. And, uh, you know, I encourage Marty has a lot of good stuff in his, in his shows. Anyway, um, I do want to emphasize one thing here. Um, this is an actual sensory element here. I think Tom and I, well, I know Tom and I have talked about this and, and don't think it is because I don't want people to get misled in their own practice. They may try this. It isn't that the name pops into your head fully formed. It isn't that the place name pops into your head fully formed. It's more of a sounding it out. It, it's uh, as Ingo described it to me at one point, he said it's really an extension of stage two in the sense that you're getting an audio kind of experience 
that you work out. When Tom shows his examples, you'll see that's what he's doing. Is he's it sounds like this sort of he doesn't say that, but it sounds like this, and then he tries to form the sounds that represent that name. So don't get confused because if you try and come up with the full name, the actual literal formal name of a, you'll end up in AOL. You got to avoid that. What you try to do is sound out what the sound of the name is. Are you all right with that, Tom? What I just I'm good said with that. Yep. Okay. And all that's right. and that's all we'll say about stage seven. <laughs> so stage eight was Ingo's stage, and he called it analytics. And he called that the ability to make yes, no decisions without inducing AOL. And that's something that would make ARV a great thing if we could ever achieve that. So stage nine and beyond was all Tom McNear. And I'll tell you a funny story about that in a minute. So. For those of you who have been through stage four, you know we have something called emotional impact. Emotional impact, which is us perceiving the thoughts and the feelings of people who are at the site. So I perceive that as sort of a telepathic communication between someone at the site and the viewer. So I thought, well, the next logical step in nine would be telepathic signals. Phase one would be receiving signals from the site, reading people's minds, perhaps. And then phase two would be sending them back to people at the site. I thought that was just a logical extension of what I had learned from Ingo Swan. And then stage 10, I felt like if we can interact with people back and forth at the site, the next would be more PK, remote action with things at the site. So I thought that phase one that would be, would be like sort of tinkering with things at the site, maybe not doing a lot, but being able to interact with them. And then phase two, which is quite a stretch I get, is teleporting things to the site. And then the phase three would be teleporting things back. So let's say um, some terrorist was getting ready to set off a large bomb. Maybe in stage 10, phase three, we could teleport that bomb from the site before it went off and send it to some place where fewer people or no people would be injured or something. And I realize it's quite a stretch. And then stage 11 would be altering dimensionality at the site. So if you read the fine print there, you'll see where I said, by the time we reach stage 11, maybe we will understand other dimensions and we will understand what I'm talking about by altering other dimensions. But the one dimension that we generally understand or we believe we do is time. So I thought phase one, we could alter time at the site. We could stop it, we could move it forward, we could move it backward. And then phase two would be altering dimensions at the site. And I said, look at the, looking at the bottom there, I realize these concepts are difficult to grasp and almost impossible to believe but they are a natural flow of the signal as it is for this reason I included them. But only time will tell, whatever time is. So that, that was where I ended my manual. And not too long after writing this, I departed. And then Paul, and crew moved on to DIA, and I continued my career with the Army. And Paul and crew developed a DIA manual that sort of picked up where I left off. And I'll let Paul talk about that. Okay, maybe- uh, Oh, excuse me, Paul. I did want to mention my one humorous thing. Oh, right. <laughs> years, years later, I was sitting, 
with Ingo on his couch in his studio. If anybody's been there, you know that his couches were picked up along the side of the road where other people had put them out for the garbage man to pick up. And Ingo proudly picked these things up and we took them into his loft down in his studio. And so that's the couch we were sitting on. And so a year or so after the program, I, we were sitting on his couch and I said to Ingo, did you, did you look at my manual? And he said, yeah, and he, he praised it. He said it was great. He said, I couldn't have done a better job of, of the flow. And he says it was very readable and very usable. And he said he liked it a lot. And I asked him if he saw stages seven through 11 and he sort of pursed his lips and in a laconic way said, yes. And I asked him, well, did you agree with any of those stages? And again, he sort of looked off in the distance and pursed his lips and said, no. And that was the end of our discussion on stages seven through 11. So those are all Tom McNear. Ingo didn't own up to it. But um, I thought it was sort of funny myself. So, Paul, if you'll pick up on the DIA manual. A couple of questions first, though. Um, sure. So did you get any feedback? For, so when you said you were tasked to, to create this manual, um, as I was for the one I did, uh, do you recall how that testing came down, how, how that happened? Yeah, they said... Um, you have been trained through stage six by Ingo. No one else ever will be. We paid a lot of money to have you trained, I think was the term that they used. And as you know, Ingo maintained the rights of all the training materials. We left everything behind at SRI when we came back. And so I was told, put it together, do it as though you were Ingo, write this so that all of the materials that you learned, all of the things that you learned are not lost when you leave. <laughs> and so I, in fact, got this done before I left. So when you say they, who was they? And I think it was Busby. Lieutenant Colonel Busby was okay. there at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was Busby, maybe Jackham, but I believe it was Busby. I, I think it had to have been Busby, actually, um, yeah. which unfortunately I don't have a picture of him, of Brian. Well, we do actually have one, but I didn't include it here now that I think about it. Um, so um, the reason I ask that question is I'm trying to figure out, um, I think that we both got tasked kind of in the same way. So, uh, I got directly tasked by Skip Atwater. He said, well, at the time he was Fred, <laughs> Fred Atwater, <laughs> but I can't call him anything but Skip anymore. Uh, at the time he came in and said, okay, we, we need you to capture everything that Ingo has taught you and that you have learned subsequently. So uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, the stage three, stage four, stage through stage six thing. So yes, we got trained by Ingo all the way up through stage, the end of stage three. It ended in December of 1984. Um, the contract had been had expired and it had not been renewed. Uh, General Stubblebine had essentially been forced to retire. It's more complicated than that, but that's the outcome of it. The army was a little bit uh, nervous about what had happened with Stubblebine and I understand their position. Uh, he was a little bit out there, even by our standards. I mean, you get right down to that. Um, he was out doing recruiting of the program for the program without knowing what the parameters were. So if he ran across, and he did, he ran across someone who was a palm reader at one of the field stations and decided that this young lady, she was very nice, but she decided because she was a palm reader, that means she would be a good remote viewer too. It brought her on. She was there for a year. It was totally useless when it came to remote viewing. Tried to train her. She never got it. She never had any success. Um, but he had also uh, tried to make some end runs. They weren't exactly illegal, but they were not really appropriate from an army perspective in, uh, in 
uh, trying to get everybody to train at the Monroe Institute. He, he, there were some accounting smoke and mirrors he went through. And he probably would have gotten away, away with that, except that there was this uh, young lieutenant. Um, I know his real name. Schnabel called him something else. And I use that same name in my book. I, at the moment, can't think of which was the real name and which was the pseudonym. So I won't, we'll just call him George, <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> anyway, uh, George had a history of some psychiatric issues. And, uh, and he uh, went to the Monroe Institute halfway through. He kind of lost it. He had some kind of psychotic break, threatened the staff, got sent back early from the, from the Monroe Institute thing. And then uh, there was a bit of a, uh, he, he got a little bit chaotic in, in the INSCOM headquarters. And that got all the way up to the Army Brass. And the Army Brass said, we can't have this stuff going on. It's Stubblebine's fault. We got to get rid of him. We got to do something about all this wild stuff and crazy stuff he's doing with INSCOM. And so um, I won't go into all that story. I talk about in my book, Reading the Enemy's Mind. But um, in the course of it, they essentially threw out the baby and the bathwater, including the remote viewing program. Fortunately, that got picked up by DIA ultimately. Um, there was enough political interest at congressional and senatorial level that it, was, it survived. So all of that background, in the meantime, we had finished stage three training and we were in limbo. Uh, the contract for Tom stage through stage six was fortunately also lasted longer for him to do that. And so what do we do? Well, Skip decided that they had enough materials and, and while Tom was still there, uh, my recollection is that you, Tom, participated in our training, uh, and plus, I guess they had access to that manual, although I, I uh, well, yeah, we'll get to that, Tom's manual here in a second. So uh, Tom and Skip formed this kind of uh, the double team where they taught us stage four, five, and six. Um, Tom was a, is just an exquisitely good student, very detailed in his notes, as you can tell from this manual. And so he turned out being a very good instructor. And we picked all this up and we did some really good work in, learning, in training and later on in operations. We had some really good successes with, with the CRV in the training in the operational environment. But then it came time as we're headed down towards DIA uh, in 1985. So there was this, we were kind of in this limbo situation where we were under the operational control of the Defense Intelligence Agency, but we still belonged to the Army. And that was when we first got tasked to write this manual. We had finished up stage six. When I say we, that was Bill Ray, Charlene Schufeld, and myself. We had finished up through stage six. And now they wanted us to codify all this stuff. And Tom's manual was kind of the backbone of the manual that Skip. So Busby told Skip to tell me to create this manual. Now, uh, let me actually. I need to share screen now, Russell. If uh, if I can get my slides up. While you're doing that, Paul, there's yeah. a question in the chat box. Okay. Um, which I guess is directed to me. Was teleportation included in the future aspects? Because due to remote viewing, you guys were open to all and any possibility, <laughs> or was this future scope due to experience <laughs> with teleportation? That was from Rich. Um, as I tried to express, you know, remote viewing flows from stage one ideograms to stage two sensations, to stage three sketches, to stage four, all the different um, aspects there, to stage six modeling. And to me, teleportation was just a logical expression out Stage 10, I guess. Whatever, whether that was 10 or 11, I, I forget. But to me, that was just a logical progression of where the signal line would take us. And as I said in the manual, it's extremely hard to believe. But if we ever continue to work in that direction, we may be surprised. So that answered that question. Okay. Yeah, we, we did not ever, uh, to my knowledge, and probably to Tom's, well, Tom can respond, but to my knowledge, uh, we never had any experience in teleportation. Nobody teleported anything anywhere, at least while I was there. 
So, uh, yeah. So uh, I got this tasking from Skip and the goal wasn't that I write this thing from scratch. I was more of the project manager, foreman, editor, what have you. So what I did was I, uh, I had Skip's thing or uh, Tom's manual, although I have no recollection of having it. But the fact is that you can see the real strong family resemblance between what we produced and what Tom had already done. So I must have had access to that. Um, so we used that as the backbone. Um, and then we had access to notes. Um, so Tom said that Ingo kept uh, ownership of all that, in which he did, at, at least in the contracts, it says that he uh, kept, uh, I, I've been trying to think of that word for the last hour. It starts with a P. Pr uh, pr proprietary. Proprietary, thank you. Proprietary, they were proprietary to him. Um, I, to this day, I'm a little unsure about how legitimate that statement was because this was work for hire. So uh, particularly work for hire for the government. So it's questionable whether the proprietary nature would stand up in court, but it was never challenged. Oh, well, right. And, and certainly it's pretty much out in the public domain today, as you can see uh, from the fact that these manuals are available to anybody who wants them, right? So, um, so Tom was a good boy and didn't bring his notes home. <laughs> but we were strongly encouraged to uh, bring copies of our notes home. You know, Ingo's listening. Well, yes, but he already knows this. <laughs> I, think he, I think I might have mentioned it to him while he was still alive, as a matter of fact, <laughs> although I don't have exact recollection of when that was. So, uh, yeah, so... It's interesting because he had us write on different colors of paper. Essays were on one color and notes were on another color. And we said, why is that? What does it have to do with remote viewing? He essentially said, it's just so I'll know if you're trying to smuggle your notes out when you leave at the end of the day, right? Because he could see the colored paper under our arm or whatever, I guess. Um, but he, I guess he hadn't entered the modern age yet because he'd forgotten about uh, photocopiers. And so we would often photocopy our notes when he wasn't looking in our essays and stuff and smuggle them home with us. Uh, we weren't doing it to cheat him. We were doing it because we were under orders and it's good military people, you know, we did it. So first off, you saw the photos before of us under Millennium. These were the folks who actually were involved in creating the DIA manual. There's again, Bill, myself, Tom and Charlene. I've, I've blurred out Ingo and, and Ed because they didn't have anything to do with the manual. Ingo of course did in that he presented us the instruction, but Ed was not with the unit at the time. He had not yet been transferred in. His part of the training was actually, he was there with us on a temporary basis. Uh, he belonged to a different organization and he had to go back to that organization once the training ended in December of 84. So, so the manual as it stands is attributable to these four people along with the further addition of Skip Outer because he's the one that first of all directed us to do it. And then I consulted with him regularly to sort it, uh, sort out what we needed to do. And if he felt like we had gotten enough, if we needed to do something else and so on. So um, we had things like our notes to work with. And these are some of my notes from that time, just briefly showing them to you. Um, this has to do with state, this was, uh, had to do with my kind of depiction of how the aperture works. Um, this had to do with the uh, original learning first time effect that happens when you're uh, when you do remote viewing for the first time and so on. Um, and here is my stage two essay. This was the final version. If you note, I got an excellent from the esteemed Ingo Swan. But what you don't see is what went into that. This was the fourth iteration of this essay. Each one. If you go back in time, each one consecutively with more red ink on it. And finally, he was satisfied. I got an excellent after having been bludgeoned for, for probably a better part of a day and a half. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think that's the last slide I have. Okay, you can pop that off, uh, Russell. Thank you. Or maybe I do it. Let me see. Oh, crud. I'm back to not having access to this. What is wrong with this? Okay, good, thank you. All right, so um, 
I, you know, I, I sometimes, if I have to speak in very short sentences, I'll say I was the author of it, but really I wasn't the author of it. I was more the, the overall manager and the editor for the manual. And I got input from Tom. I got input from Bill and Charlene um, and uh, Skip even because he'd, he'd done a lot, been to SRI a lot and gotten a lot of presentations on this stuff, gotten a lot of reports on it. So he was actually quite well informed in the process as well. And so I, I tended, I kind of collated all this information. I rewrote if it needed to be re, rewritten to fit into the context and places where there are gaps, then I wrote that part myself. So if there's any original writing in this, I guess I was the author of it from that perspective. But I always want to give credit to the folks who, who also were important players in putting this all together. Um, Tom, I'm not sure if you were involved all the way through. I mean, it was mostly done in 1985, but I think you you transferred out in 1985, did you not? I was gone. Do you remember what month? No. Okay, well, well, I, I know you had some role in it, and then uh, the rest of it, I guess, we put together as we could with what uh, with Skip's uh, institutional memory and your uh, and your uh, notes and stuff in your manual. And so we created that. And then we sent the manuscript off to DIA. And normally when you get a document published at, at the Defense Intelligence Agency or any of these major three letter organizations, they have a series of document numbers that they fix on official documents. Um, the document number tells you all kinds of things about that document. This never had a document number. Let me grab something here real quick if I can find it. That's not it. Here it is. This is actually, so um, how do I get big screen, Russell? You're still. Uh, you're still big on. screen to us, Paul. Oh, are, am I? Oh, my mistake. Okay, good. So this is the original manual. This was the first copy of the original manual. There's no document number on this, as you can see. This was an informal publication of the DIA, I think because they didn't know exactly what to do with it. It was technically not classified, so they couldn't classify it as a, as a uh, classified document and it didn't fit in with any of their other uh, document production systems. So it's an informal document, has no uh, classification on it or anything. It does say, I think on the title sheet, let me look real quick. Um, it doesn't even actually say DIA on it, uh, even though it was them that printed it. They printed about 30 copies, I think. Uh, this was the one that I used training for me. Let me find you a typical page here. Well, there's one right there. You see how it's marked up? Maybe you can see that. I don't know. Um, as you go through this thing, there's all kinds of places where I've added stuff um, written in the margins. And all that has to do with using as a training manual because it wasn't actually designed as a training manual. It was designed to capture Ingo's... Um, methodology, his, te his, his technology, if you will, in controlled remote viewing. And, um, but as I went through using it, trying to convert it over to use it in a training environment at Fort Meade first, uh, then um, I found out, well, we need to add a few things in here because showing it in cold, hard type on a page isn't quite the same thing as teaching somebody about it. And so I note, added notes in there to help facilitate the teaching process. And, and there were occasionally some things that got left out of it that should have been in there that were Ingo, but we had missed. Like, for example, there's a series of breaks that you can take. There's an AOL break. There's a bilocation break. There's a miss break. A con I mean, sorry, there's confusion break. There's a too much break. There's all these different kinds of breaks that you can take as the different ways that you get hit by the signal line and have to have to untangle yourself from it. The one thing that isn't in there is the miss. <laughs> we missed the miss. <laughs> Great. It was in mine. <laughs> oh, good for you, Tom. I'm sorry. I just blanked on it. It was there. So I, it told me to miss it. So I did. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I, I discovered that one day. I thought, oh, well, that's an irony that that's the one thing we didn't get in there, you know? So, um, so it got refined over time. Then PowerPoint came along when I was teaching. I even use this in my, uh, my civilian classes. Uh, this manual, uh, along with a bunch of uh, view graphs, if you remember those, was how I, I presented it. And then when PowerPoint came along, I realized I could put everything in a PowerPoint and it worked as notes. So I didn't have to keep referring back to a book or whatever. I just showed it on the screen. It reminded me what I needed to say. 
uh, it was quite a, quite a uh, revelation to be able to do that. So um, the manual got published. Uh, every new student, a CRV student that came in, we gave them a copy of it. And in the process also presented lectures based on what was in the manual. Uh, Lynn Buchanan was the only CRV in-house CRV student who never had, uh, who was not taught out of the manual because we started, we started teaching him and Tom played a big role in teaching Lynn Buchanan. Uh, we started teaching him in 1984, towards the end of 1984. Uh, we weren't quite done with stage three, but we were able to present certainly stage one and stage two in the process, and then continue that on through into 1985. And, and I think probably he was finished early 86. I'd have to look at the record, but I think early 86, Lynn was through it and it was before the manual was available. So the rest of all the other CRV students um, had access, the, their instructors, and they themselves had access to this manual. And of course, then <clears throat> when uh, the program was shut down and all the stuff was carted off in boxes to the CIA, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and run through the declassification process. Um, wait a minute. I'm not sure this showed up in the archives. Does anybody know? Russell, do you know if, that, if this was in the actual archives? Tom's was, but I'm not sure this one was. I believe it is. I'll check real quick. Okay. So in any case, um, it became public even before the dog, the archives were declassified because, um, <clears throat> so the first iteration of it was Ed Dames, when he started SciTech, he originally wasn't going to train anybody. That was a big thing. I don't going to train people to do this. I'm only going to use experienced people to do SciTech, to do remote viewing. Uh, eventually realized that he, he couldn't continue on without training people. And so um, he slapped a TRV, a, a technical remote viewing cover on it and, and gave it to all the students, but it was just the CRV manual with a different cover on it. Uh, and so it kind of escaped captivity at that point. We're talking, I think, roughly 93 or 94. Um, and then uh, it was even before the program was declassified. And then ultimately it got published on the internet by PJ Gaynor or, or Palin Gaynor, as many of you know, um, she got sent multiple copies of it and decided it should be available to all to all posterity. So she decided to publish it over my objections. I didn't feel like it should be out in public and she thought it ought to. So I finally gave in and, and wrote an intro introduction for it, explaining that it wasn't a training manual. It was meant to capture the Ingo methodology. Um, and since then it's proliferated. Uh, I've have it posted on my page. I think Daz has got it on his. Dad has it in a book he published. Um, it's, it's available lots of places. In fact, there are people out there selling it on Amazon. <laughs> I can't believe it. They, they uh, turn it into a Kindle or whatever, and then they're selling it for 10 bucks and you can get it for free on the internet. So I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the history of that. Um, um, they're, they're, these are very organically similar, Tom's and mine, because Tom's was an important influence on the one that I came out with, with, with you know, I say on mine, but with everybody who helped. Um, and so, um, and we have these, and, and thank goodness we do, because if we were trying to piece this together from, uh, from what Ingo has, it would be a total, uh, total, I don't say mess, but it would be very hard to really capture again what Ingo had taught us in a formal way uh, based on just what's residual in his archives. Um, so these are really valuable in preserving that Ingo CRV legacy that we talked about earlier on. So anyway, that's, uh, I think that captures pretty much what we uh, have to say about this. Do you wanna add anything, Tom, uh, that you thought of while I was talking? No, I think that wrapped it up real well, you know, um, and the fact that yours wasn't classified was a good thing. As you saw, mine at the time was considered classified and um, it wasn't out until the FOIA in 1995. Yeah. Well, and even then it wasn't out until they actually went through the D-class process and became finally publicly available in 2004 but you had to go to the National Archives to get it. And then finally, uh, the no, I'm sorry, in 2004, you know, is, is before that it was at the archives. And then in 2004, the CIA offered it in 14 CD-ROMs. You could buy the package for about a hundred something. And I immediately did. Um, 
and then uh, and then finally in uh, what year was it? 2017 that the CIA put it on that internet database where you could uh, you could actually go into it and search and, and get all the stuff. So um, anyway, yeah, it's 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 a checkered legacy in, in between. Anyway, a- anything else you want to say at the moment, Tom? No, there are quite a few questions yeah. on the chat line. Yeah, in fact, there's one here I want to answer right now from Rich. Uh, I'm going to let Russell uh, call the questions for the most part, but I, this one popped up and I saw it, so so I'll answer it. He says, um, "Have your talking to me? Have your feelings changed regarding having this information so open to the public? What were your initial or current concerns?" <clears throat> so my feelings now are that the the horses are out of how, well, it's always cows, isn't it? The cows are out of the barn. Uh, it doesn't matter how I feel about it anymore. You know, it's the way it is. And it's out there and it's in public. And, and um, it does give us a good reference point of what Inga was talking about. Uh, there are still ambiguities because we couldn't capture everything and all the nuances in one volume like that, in which still leaves room for debate and controversy and stuff. But at least we have Tom's and this one as a starting point. And what were my initial concerns? That we would end up right where we are. I thought that's gonna come out. I've already seen what, what Ed Dames is trying to do with it. The more people that have it, the more the whole thing is going to un- explode or implode, depending on how you look at it, right? Um, the more uh, deviant processes we're gonna have because people will take that as a starting point and then they'll start elaborating, uh, compounding, uh, extrapolating and all of that stuff and we'll end up with essentially chaos in the remote viewing world. And, and in fact, I turned out to be pretty much right about that. Uh, it wasn't all caused by the manual. And in fact, in some ways, maybe the manual served to help uh, keep at least some constraints on that human tendency to just, you know, go crazy with, with things that they come up with that they find interesting. So uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Even at this point, I guess I don't know whether I was right or not about being reluctant to put it up there or have it put up there. So great. <laughs> then we'll go to R. Caristo. What was the questions like in the questionnaire to access, or I'm sorry, to assess Tom to enter the CRV program? Yeah, that was the typical sort of psychological test that says, do you like to read or do you like to watch TV? I mean, it was much more in depth than that. Are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Um, in fact, <laughs> I do have a copy of it here. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so factor one was it's on a scale of one to seven, and you would rate yourself anywhere on that scale of one to seven. So the factor one is socially cautious, often cool and distant with relationships is one end, which was very much me. Socially participating, usually friendly and warm hearted is the other end. Factor two, slower than average in thinking and learning. (laughs) The other end was above average in thinking and learning, able to deal effectively with most abstract ideas and theories. And so those were the sorts of questions, generally accommodating, generally dominant, decisive, think or act on feelings, think or act based on reality, uh, reserved, serious-minded, non-expressive in manner, enthusiastic and expressive, flexible and expedient, consistent and persevering, cautious, restrained, assertive, bold, and action-oriented. So you get the idea. There were 14 of those. And, you know, I have my master's degree in psychology, and I can tell you that the validity of that questionnaire would be extremely low. Why do I say that? Well, if you took that in the morning 
and then you took it just before lunch when you were really hungry. And then you took it after lunch when you had a full stomach. And then you took it later that evening, you would come up with four different sets of criteria that you would answer on that. Um, it, but it was their first effort to try and ascertain some criteria of, you know, we have 50,000 soldiers out there. What two or three are we going to bring into the program? And so that was the questionnaire that they came up with. Okay. Next question is also for Tom and it's from Sylvia. Are you using CRV now for any specific purpose? <laughs> I'm using CRV as part of ARV. I'm working with Marty Rosenblatt and the APP. Um, I'm sort of on the sidelines on that. He has me teaching CRV because CRV is the process that we use and ARV is how that information. <laughs> and then I'm the guy that Everyone in my family calls anytime they lose their keys or they can't find their iPad or their cell phone. And I'll have to say I'm more successful and I don't know why. I'm more successful in finding things like that than I typically am in CRV. And there are several of them. And I'll just give you two examples. I call it knowing. Sometimes when somebody asks me, I know the answer to that question. And even though when they, they tell me, no, no, you're wrong, <laughs> I say, no, no, I'm right, because I'm so confident. One time my wife asked me, where is my grandson's iPad? And I said, it's under the driver's seat in the Toyota. And she says, no, I looked there. I said, go look again. That's where it is. And she went and looked again. And sure enough, it had slid a little farther up than she thought. Um, and that's where it was. And one day, my daughter, who has a security clearance, worked at Fort Eustis, called to say she couldn't find her, her ID card to get on base. And I saw the ID cards standing at an angle and on a gray, soft sort of a thing. And it was enclosed between something. And then I knew it was between the seat and the console in her car. And just as I realized that, the aperture opened up to me and I saw her standing next to her car with the car door open, looking in her car, trying to find it. And so I texted her, it's in your car between the console and the driver's seat and you're at Newport News Park looking for it. And she texted back, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I am always the first person that they, they call when they lose things. So yes, I'm using CRV on a daily basis. And then I liked Gabe's comment, sorry for jumping in there, Russell. When Paul was trying to figure out what the P word is, Gabe says that, did I use stage seven to assist Paul in finding proprietary? <laughs> so this is from Cedric. Tom's proposed additional stages seem to be quite interactive with the target, much more than the original stages. Do we know if Ingo's rumored additional stages were also similarly interactive with the target in their nature? And I, I believe what we're talking about is the uh, alleged stages where Ingo took it to stage 18 or 28 yes. or whatever. So let, let me respond quickly and I'll let Tom respond. Um, first of all, I think the rumored stages are actually based on this manual. I think the rumored stages are typical rumors where there's a some little thing that starts them and then it gets all blown out of proportion, okay? Um, I do not believe that Ingo had 18 stages. Uh, that he was speculating about. I think that probably people heard about Tom's manual and then started extrapolating from there, including some of the, um, uh, some people who tend to elaborate in, in their stories anyway. So uh, that's what I would say. Now, Tom, maybe you have some different insight there. No, 
I, I will say this. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or step on anybody's toes. But, you know, this is sort of a history lesson here for the manuals, and this is a history lesson for CRV. I've heard people talk about Ingo's advanced stages, and I've heard 18. I actually heard 38 mentioned at one time. And I can say that I was with Ingo just months before his passing. And Ingo never went beyond stage six. He tampered with stage seven um, with me because it was coming my last 11 sessions all had stage seven phonetics in it. So we, we messed with that a little bit, but I agree with Paul. The rumored ones are just rumors. Maybe I'm at fault for expanding on Ingo 7 and taking it to 11. But I can assure the audience that Ingo never went past 7. And the, the rumored advanced stages are just those. Mm -hmm. So um, the one thing I want to add is, and it, this may have come out after Tom, well, Tom already mentioned this somewhat, but what Ingo, when I was calling stage eight, which is analytics, that's alphanumerics and that kind of thing, uh, he did work on that. He was working on that, I think, towards the end of our training in 1984 even. And at one time he switched them around. He had eight, you know, the analytics being stage seven and phonetics, or as he earlier called it, apparently sonics as stage, stage eight. But then he went back to phonetics being stage seven and analytics being stage eight. And the, my last recollection of what he said was that he had given up on analytics because he couldn't make them work and that he was done with experimenting. So, you know, stage seven was, is fairly concrete. There's no doctrine on it like there is a stage six back to stage one, but uh, no solid doctrine at any rate. There's no training associated with it. Uh, but the stage eight analytics, he did play with that. Um, because I heard, heard multiple references from him about it, but he claimed no success with it ultimately and gave up on it. So it, to my knowledge, that's as far as he went. And Tom has even more recent knowledge than that. Um, and so I've always thought that these rumored advanced stages that Ingo was working on were just rumors or wishful thinking or whatever, so. And regarding the analytics, I can throw in a, a little vignette there to, to clarify that. When I visited with Ingo, um, he and his neighbor, I won't mention the neighbor's name, were working on trying to win the lottery. <laughs> and so at five every day, this neighbor would come over and Ingo would sit and come up with some numbers and hand them to his neighbor. And as I told you, Ingo's health wasn't good there toward the end. So Ingo couldn't race down to the 7-Eleven and buy the tickets. So his neighbor did that. And Ingo admitted that he was, in his words, an abject failure at trying to win the lottery. He was working on the pick seven, I think it was called, in New York. And he said he never got more than two correct at any one time. And most of the time never got any correct. And that was the analytics that he was trying to work on. Now, I've heard rumors that he won the lottery so many times in one month. And that's, again, just not the case. Okay, good. Thank you, Tom. So there uh, have been several questions in that regard. So I think Tom and Paul both with direct experience uh, interacting with Ingo right up to Ingo's passing, those alleged stages are, are probably not as they may have been represented. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the next one here. This is from Rid. Did Skip have any firsthand experience of remote viewing, whether ERV or CRV? Firsthand meaning he personally did it himself? Is that That's the way I'm interpreting the question. Did he actually do CRV sessions or ERV sessions himself? Well, you want to take what you know about that, Tom, and I'll follow up. No, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the answer is, uh, 
Not as far as I know. He certainly did not do it at Fort Meade when I was there. And I was there for six of his six years of the time he was there. And there was actually a reason for it. There was a, there was a requirement by the brass um, that the people running the program should not engage in remote viewing itself because they were afraid they would, these guys, the ones who were supposed to be running, would lose their objectivity. Um, and it would make them uh, unreliable in terms of how they were managing the program. Uh, Hal Putoff had the same restraint from the contract folks, like DIA and before that CIA, that he was not allowed to engage in remote viewing himself. They could manage it, they could monitor it, whatever, they could help with the training, but they could not do it themselves for fear that they would lose their objectivity. Um, I had a conversation with Skip about this at one point, uh, which I probably have recorded somewhere, but I don't know where, um, where he said that he had done remote viewing or something like remote viewing earlier on. Uh, in fact, the conversation came back to me. He was, he was dynamite at diagnosing car pro problems. He just sort of intuitively knew what was wrong with the car, what capacity. It's kind of like people want to approach medical diagnosis with people. He approached that with cars. <laughs> and he said, uh, he, to use, have no better word than this, but intuition, his intuition would kick in and he had no other indicators other than what was externally manifest. And he could identify internal problems to a car engine and be right pretty much all the time. And so um, it was in that that actually got him going kind of in this field. Um, although his parents were um, spiritualists, they were in the spiritualist church or whatever it's called. And, and so he had an exposure early on to this kind of uh, uh, non-local kind of perception and consciousness. But particularly at Fort Meade, he avoided that practice for very practical reasons. Tom, anything to add to that? No, um, I agree with Paul. He never remote viewed while I was at the program. He was always the monitor at the other end of the table or in ERV sitting at the desk. Um, but, you know, we all know Skip had his own way about him. And so, uh, but he just didn't remote view. I have a question from Pablo. Um, he had a three-part question. I skipped the first one because I believe it's been answered. So I'm going to just break down the part two and part three quickly. Regarding psychokinesis, have you ever heard of Ingo producing pictures <laughs> in photographic film with his mind only? No, I haven't heard of that. Um, but you know, as far as Ingo and PK, Ingo was tasked with trying to affect magnetometer at SRI. That's how it all got started. And Ingo was thinking to himself, well, how am I going to do that? I don't even know what it looks like. So he remote viewed the magnetometer to see what it looked like. And while he was doing that, that's what caused the magnetometer to go off. So in his remote viewing, in what he thought of remote viewing, he was actually affecting the magnetometer. So he certainly had that ability, but I know of no instance of him using photographic film. I do know that Stanislav Ojak is the film guy. Oh, has he done that? Yes. <laughs> I had no idea. He's well documented on that. Interesting. So, and there are other people who've done that. Uh, was it Ted Sirios, I think, uh, also did that? Somebody like him. Um, yes, and, and in all my associations, we never even brought the topic up. You know, so I, I think he probably didn't. And, and he had, he had P, uh, PK experience even... Uh, it wasn't just at the SRI thing. In fact, the reason Hal took him in to try and interact with that uh, cork detector was because he had done uh, a fair amount of PK research at, uh, with Gertrude Schmeidler, I believe it was, at the City College of New York, or it might have been with uh, Carla Sosas at the SPR. Uh, but at, yeah, it was Schmeidler because Schmeidler had, had published a paper in one of the parapsychology journals about Ingo Swan's interaction with with uh, smaller thermistors and things like that. And that's one of the reasons why Putoff decided he would take a risk and have Ingo come out and do the experiment is because Ingo had sent along 
couple of these peer reviewed journal papers. And that was provocative. Uh, uh, Hal thought that that was maybe enough ed evidence to justify the trouble you would have to go to to make this happen. So. I believe in uh, remote viewing the real story and also psychic uh, sexuality. Uh, Ingo had made references to some Krillian photography uh. he may have been involved in, but I, I can't quote the page and uh, okay. paragraph on that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pablo again, Lynn mentioned in another meeting that usually stages alternate drawing with the text, but that stage five is completely a different thing. Is that correct? Can you share any thoughts on stage five? Stage five, Ingo sort of talked that, about it. He used the word a corrective process or actually detaching from the signal line and going back into your data and looking at the, the antecedents that caused you to say certain things. So if you talked about an angle or if you talked about a <coughs> particular object, you would go back and query that and find out what were the, the signals that you perceive that caused you to say angle or that caused you to say blue. And so stage five is a, I only did eight stage fives total because it's an onerous task to be able to go through and do a thorough stage five. Although it's a very powerful tool, I was able to identify U.S. Grant's farm and describe U.S. Grant's height and weight and call him by name through using stage five to describe Grant's farm. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's an onerous task. And if you look in my manual, um, there, I have an example in there that will answer a lot of the questions people might have about stage five. Mm -hmm. So um, Ingo would have described the different stages differently. He talked about detect mode and decode mode. Do you remember that, Tom? So the idea was some stages were detect, where you're capturing the signal line is, and is producing information. The decode mode is where you then proceed to uh, exploit that information, okay? So uh, I may get this message. I always should, I need, I don't talk about this often enough to remember. <laughs> I have to go back and look at my notes, but I, I think stage one was a detect mode. Stage two was decode. Stage three was detect. Uh, stage four was decode. Um, although there's a little of both in stage three. Stage five was something completely different. Stage five is off signal line. What it does is exploit all of the information that has been dumped in your subconscious by the signal line that never made it up through the aperture into conscious awareness. So uh, just like everything else in our lives, our conscious awareness is aware of only a fraction of what we actually are experiencing. All that experience, most of it's left below the liminal threshold and only pieces of it come up as just deemed necessary by, by the management systems in our minds, right? So there's a lot of information down there that we just never access. And in stage five, what you're doing is the signal line dumps a bunch of stuff in your subconscious. And in the process of CRV structure, you pull some of that out, but there's still a bunch of stuff under there you can't access and with that you don't access. Stage five is designed to access that. So it isn't actually on the signal line. You're not being psychic technically. What you're doing is you're mining the information that's there uh, in a very careful way because um, very obviously you could get you off into AOL very, very quickly if you don't do it right. Um, and so you have to be very careful. It is verging on too much left brain in this. That's, that's what drove me nuts is I prefer to stay over in the right brain area and stage five kind of pulls you this way into the left brain but it's very some of my best sessions ever involved stage fives and you know they're, they're it's a very valuable stage but it is different than the rest of them for that reason okay well said so what i want to do in honor of Daz sharing this um time for you and tom and mm -hmm. um, his other contributions is after I read this question, give me a second to introduce Daz so he can come on live, ask his question, and then okay. after that, I'll step so, up. 
So Daz has a question. Okay, good. Okay. All right, well, let's get the chat one done. Well, yeah. Okay. So this is from Mandy. Does bilocation come into play when viewing a target? And if so, could you retrieve objects or just information? You know, Tom and I, and I have had some conversations about this, and I think he's got a great answer, at least to the first part of it, and probably the second part as well, because uh, I think I know where that will go as well. So, so Tom, you want to respond to that? Sure. I will tell you what bilocation meant when I trained with Ingo. Bilocation was a good thing. It meant you were in two places at once. There was enough of you at the site that you were perceiving information about the site and sending it back to the, to the you that was sitting behind the table. And then the other part of that bilocation is you needed to be enough in the room that you were there to objectify, write down whatever you were perceiving. So he would watch closely. And if you got to be a little chatty, that meant you were too much in the room and not enough at the site. And if you had long pregnant pauses, that typically meant your perceptions were too much at the site and not enough in the room writing down. So that's what bilocation meant to Ingo at the time he taught me, that bilocation is something that you needed to do. You needed to be a little bit at the site and a little bit in the room. And if you were too much one or the other, we took a bilo break. Bilo break is when you recognized you were too much there. So you would take a minute break to, to reorient yourself and then go at it again. Or a bilo break meant you were too much in the room, you were losing contact with the site, you would take a break and then reestablish contact with the signal line and then proceed from there. That's what bilocation meant. Ringo. Let me jump in real quick. Um, and this illustrates that there were some differences between what, how he presented things to us and how to Tom. In our training, as near as I can recall, as far as I found in my notes, bilo, bilocation, well, first of all, the very first thing to say is when Ingo talked about bilocation, and Tom may have a different view of this, but when Ingo talked about bilocation, he was talking about conscious awareness. He wasn't talking about like an out of body experience. It wasn't that your spirit self was there at the target. It was that you were so consciously engrossed in the target that you stopped paying attention to where you were. Are you all right with that, Tom? You agree with that? Yes. Okay, good. Well said. Okay. So um, with us, he cautioned us against bilocation, but he was talking more in the terms of what Tom has talked about, the extreme being present consciously at the target, because he discouraged us from doing that. He said, if you end up so that you can't, report back, and I describe it, the experience, having had it, as being kind of like in a deep daydream, but you're all engrossed in what's at the target. You stop reporting back, and the point of remote viewing is to bring back information. It's not to have an experience. It's nice that you have an experience of the process, but if you stop reporting, you're failing as a remote viewer. <laughs> so, so he discourages us from trying to bilocate, at least to that degree. When Tom and I talked about this, I had more insight about bilocation, realizing you do have to, and I have had the experience of having a very good, strong, conscious experience of being at the target, but not so strong that I couldn't write down and verbalize and sketch what it was that I was experiencing. So Tom added an additional dimension that Ingo, for whatever reason, and I think he may have just been Anytime you teach somebody, you realize that sometimes you leave things out. You free, oh, I should have told them that, you know, or whatever. Uh, and, and I think maybe he just got involved in that aspect of it and forgot to tell us that there's this other aspect. To some degree, you ought, you have to bilocate at least consciously with the target in order to even perceive things there. And so uh, I think these two answers together really kind of probably capture the essence of what Ingo believed about bilocation. Okay, good. Oh, there was that second part. Can you retrieve object or just information? As far as, no, you can't. I'm going to say you can't. Obviously, I don't know everything in the universe, but I know of no instance where anyone has ever brought back an object from the target. Tom? 
No, although the Chinese claim to have some um, teleportation <laughs> experiments that have been successful with atoms, you know, yeah. very tiny, tiny things. Um, I've seen nothing that says it. Although, as Paul said, who knows where we'll end up 10, 20 years from now or next week. I'm going to say my one thing and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's hard for me to do it without being sappy. <clears throat> so I apologize for, for that part. For myself, to Ingo, to Tom, to Paul, there's no way I can even come close to thanking you guys enough for what you've done, for your presence, for your training. My life is so transformed and, and it goes back, you know, to Ingo How the 500 people Ingo always credited, but Tom, I'm so grateful that you've come back into this. Paul, you know what our experience has been probably not the best for you, but certainly the best for me. And uh, so anyways, with that, I'm going to open the floor to Daz. Daz, uh, in the chat, uh, presented a challenge to the notion that there aren't extra stages. And so, Daz, would you come on board here and make your case? I can't uh, go into detail about them now. Um, but uh, what I can say to, to Tom Poy is that I have found uh, in Ingo's... Uh, archive files i think four or five references now in letters uh and in and in, in a folder marked important rv information uh in that in that document alone there was a set of 12 stages listed but in in three or four letters to other people over a period of time he was talking about how he had been developing these other stages and he does list uh three or four of them on on other occasions and yeah. also i have statements from uh, Tom B, who also did quite a lot of training over a period of years with Ingo in a slightly different method of CRV than you guys did uh, about these extra methods and extra changes. And he's also getting me some copies of his slightly different CRV sessions that he has archived that he did with Ingo as well. I haven't got them yet, but I will have all this stuff that I can actually present a case that there was some further development work that, that Ingo did. Okay, well, we don't know everything, so uh, I'm yeah. open to checking it out. Yeah. And Russell, before we go on to the raising of hands, there is one interesting question from Don that he says there seems to be some conflicting information about whether one should stay blind to the site or one should name the site. He mentions it. Joe named the submarine and I named an airport and that sort of thing. So he's, he's curious, should we name the site or should we remain blind? And the answer is yes. The goal is not to name the site. The goal is to perceive the data and objectify it on paper. And as you get more and more refined information, what that site is becomes obvious. So if you, in my, that my case, was an airport, MacDill Air Force Base. If I know it's an airport, I don't want to not say that in order to, you know, it's hard to articulate. If you recognize what it is, of course you should say it. That's not the goal. The goal is to perceive, objectify the data, and let an analyst take it from there. But if you're enough at the site that you recognize what the site is, of course you write it down. I should say I was a little bit confused by the question because it's not a matter of being blind. Blind is that you don't know what the site is up front. You don't know what the target is up front. That's blind. But in terms of uh, declaring what the target is in terms of noun and occasionally in terms of proper noun. So there's two ways of naming it in remote viewing. One is you just give the generic kind of thing it is like, it's a submarine, or you can give a proper name, which is Typhoon, which is the name of the submarine. Now, Joe never said Typhoon. He just said it's a submarine, as did Harley Trent, by the way. 
Hartley gets left out of this, but but some of Hartley, uh, some of the work on the Typhoon submarine project was also Hartley Trent's, and he identified as a submarine as well. So uh, so we, we again, it's like a Rob Cowart. People ignore Hartley because he doesn't have a big role, but he still was there, and I like to acknowledge that for folks. Um, but yeah, I, I had an encounter with Ingo. Uh, I might have mentioned it somewhere. I don't know, but I showed him uh, some of my student sessions, and and he sees where one of the students actually specifically said what kind of a target it was. Let's pretend it was a submarine. He said, right here, AOL break submarine. He said, why didn't you end the session there? And I said, you don't feedback on an AOL. He says, you do if it's correct. Otherwise, how is the student going to know when they're on the signal or not, right? So there are times when it's perfectly appropriate to actually declare what the target is. I have a bunch of them that I worked with Ingo and, and uh and Russ and uh, Skip both and other folks back in the train where I actually did say what the target was in terms of the generic description. Once, once or twice, it was actually the proper name. And um, if, if that happens, it's great. If that happens, it's great. But don't aim for that, like Tom said. Okay, let's do the, all those hands that I'm sure they're getting tired of holding their arms up out there. Okay, I'll call them out. Um... If people are interested and you go to YouTube and Google Tom McNear, he has a 16 minute video there. Um, a photo was shown from the session that he did with Ingo in 2011, which when you look at the uh, angle over Tom and you can see the farm, it's a straight CRV session. In his advanced visual, Tom uh, named the target. And something that impressed me significantly and made me ponder was Tom considered naming the target before he started the session a failure? And I was like, what the heck could that possibly mean? Yay, you named the target. Let's say that your tasker knew that it was Bridal Veil vale Falls or Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. But what they wanted to know is how do we rescue the boat you know, that's stuck on a little island before they go over the falls? They already know what the target, so you name it, great. That's where I realized when Tom said that, it's describe it, give the information, put more data there than the person tasking you knows. Um, so if you do go Google Tom's name uh, on YouTube, it's a wonderful video and I highly suggest it. So now, uh, I don't know how your name's pronounced. I'll just say it is Jana and then you correct me. Jana, please jump in and ask your question. You've been patiently waiting for a long time. Oh, no problem. This hand is holding up uh, very easily. Um, <laughs> Jana is the correct pronunciation, but okay. I, I know if I'm in. First, I would like to join your thanks, Russell. And uh, it's a big pleasure to Tom and um, to Paul to have both, in you, both of you in one room, in the same room. And if, if I may say this, um, it's a pleasure to me to have two new German folks here listening. <laughs> In the back, uh, Tanya and Abo. Hello, nice uh, uh, and, and good that you joined us. Nice and <laughs> yes, we. Um, my <laughs> question is to both of you, to Paul and to Tom. Um, Paul wrote down that uh, the first documentary was made from the end of 1984 to February 1985 because the remote viewing program was in danger. Uh, of being discontinued. And did you have plans what you would do if the program was not gone uh, ahead and if it was discontinued? Would you have let go remote you again or would you have not? Tom's answer is real easy. He was already on orders to go somewhere else, so he didn't have to worry. <laughs> no, per personally, uh, would you have uh, done remote viewing as a, as a skill? in your life further or not? Well, Tom actually has demonstrated. Uh, I mean, he went off and had a regular army career, but I don't know, did you did you do any remote viewing in those intervening years before you came, out, came back to meet Ingo? Very rarely, a handful of times, um, Ingo would ask me to do something for him. And of course I would, but um, no, to me, as I said to you, my dad was a scientist. Going into this program was research, was 
exciting, was something I wanted to try and do. And once I achieved it, I was sort of ready for the next phase of my life. So in my case, I, I don't know what I would have done had it not continued. I don't even have a thought about that. I mean, the, the, the intellectual thinking, cognitive level was, um, okay, if it goes down, I got to find another placement. What could I do that was anywhere near as interesting as this? Oh, man, I don't know if I want to go back to Middle East or not anymore, you know. Uh, it used to be the thing I liked the most. And when I did remote viewing, that sort of got became a secondary thing for me. And and so I don't know. There's there's after this, everything is an anticlimax, you know. So, uh, but at the same time, even though I was really worried about it, I also kind of felt like it was not going to happen. That it was going to continue, and which it did, you know. So, mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, we Jimmy. will switch over to Jimmy. So Jimmy, no pressure, but make it a good one, man. Well, I'll try to. Uh, it, uh, so I was wondering if Paul or Tom could clarify what you would learn from the hypothetical uh, stage eight analytics that's different than what you would learn from the stage five interrogation of the signal line. And also, I was wondering if you could repeat the name of the gentleman who, like Ted Sirios, did photography or psychic photography. The photo guy was Stanislav Ojak. Ojak. O apostrophe J-A-C-K. And if you are praying people, I would ask you to say a prayer for him. He had four hours of surgery today and he's 93 years old. Will and do. So, prayers, prayers up. Thank you. He's not so, a, a public figure though. If, if you're trying to look up uh, anything he's done, I don't think you'll find anything. Tom, do you think? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. That's a good question. He's been in the community for years, but he stays in the background. A good friend of Ingo's, that's how I met him first. Uh, yep. He lives in, you know, one of his biggest liabilities, he lives in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and anybody who lives there has got a limited lifespan. Oh, just kidding. If anybody were from there, I just like to dis. I mean, it's one of the windiest places in the universe on I 80 up there. So. so that was answering, Jimmy, that was answering your second question. What was your first? What would you learn in the hypothetical stage eight, seven or eight analytics that's different than the stage five interrogation of the signal line? Because that seems kind of analytical too. Yeah, yeah. Well, in stage five, you're dredging up additional information, as Paul so eloquently stated, you're dredging up information that's within your subconscious that your conscious was unaware of. But as Ingo explained to me, he saw analytics as being able to do a yes, no answer without inducing AOL. He hypothesized that you would be able to recognize letters and numbers and that you would be able to perhaps read as part of analytics without inducing AOL. And that without inducing AOL is the important part of it. Mm -hmm. But as I said, if stage eight is winning the lottery, he was still struggling with that months before passing. Yeah, and, and if you think about it, the, the name gives you a clue as to what the point is. So analytics, we come we have analytical overlay. What it means is that it's the left brain speaking very generally, left brain that does all the analysis. We have the left brain interpreter as uh, last week I mentioned Michael Gazanik. He's he's the one that's uh, came up with this concept that you have the left brain interpreter. It's a it's a module, it doesn't mean it's an actual you know, defined region of the brain, but it's still a processing module in the brain that takes the information and then crunches it and gives you an, an it analyzes it essentially and gives you an, an answer. That's why we call it analytical overlays because the left brain is analyzing the data and then making conjecture from that, right? Um, alphanumerics, letters and words are largely processed in the left hemisphere, not exclusively, but largely. And, and verbal speech, that's the only kind of speech there is, I guess, anyway, uh, speech is, is processed largely in the left hemisphere. 
Uh, and so alphanumerics are part of, they're the elements of speech. And so they're more, the left brain is much more familiar with dealing with those than the right brain. The problem with trying to get letters and numbers in a remote viewing session is your left brain then gets called into play much more prominently than it, than it usually can be without you getting just totally swamped in analytical overlay. So the, the letters and numbers help spark AOL in the brain. And so overcoming that problem is massive. And that's what Ingo was working on. He was trying to figure out, and it's still signaling data, you know, the signaling can bring you at letters and, and numbers and words and stuff as well. It isn't a limitation of the remote viewing. It's a limitation of the psychological processing, the neuropsychological processing in the human that causes the problem. And so the data on signaling, our, our brain mechanism, our mental processes don't allow that to happen in a way that you can extract data from. And Engel really wanted to break that code. He really wanted to figure out how to do it. And that's why I was working on it. But it also explains why I had such a struggle with it, because it's a very hard thing to solve. It may not be solvable, but, you know, who knows? I would like to throw in one last thing on the left right hemisphere. I say that when we are writing our summary at the end of a CRV session, that is a right brained analysis. Now, when you say right brain analysis, people start throwing things at you. But what I'm what I am saying is we are trying to keep our right our right brain engaged, but we're asking questions of it and trying to put some of those pieces together without letting our left brain become overly engaged and make some quantum leaps that are incorrect. So I talk about a right brain analysis as being part of the CRV process that kicks in from time to time. Thank you very much and great session today, you guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We got three minutes before we're right at the bottom of the hour. Does anybody okay. have a short question? Well, here, let's let's wrap it up this way. So I several people have asked about saving the chat, including you. Okay. So I have done it. And so you know, oh, Paul, good. this is gonna All be right. recorded to my computer and I'll get it to you through Dropbox. So uh, um, the recording is gonna end up on yours because I made you host. Is that what happens? Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. The, yeah. Send it the, to me. Uh, fees for you accessing it are going to be, let's say, reasonable at the least. Okay. Okay. So, right. Tom, thank you so much for um, the extra 30 minutes. I would invite a closing statement from each of you and then end, uh, end the chat. Go ahead, Tom. All right. Well, I just want to thank Paul and and Russell for inviting me to participate in this. Thank Daz for the the time on the air. Um, it was an honor to be able to, to answer some of your questions. You know, we're all in this together and none of us have all the answers. But um, I think this was an interesting dialogue with me having started with Ingo and gone through stage six and then Paul having picked up and run with it from there. Uh, Paul's an amazing asset to the community and I'm honored to be invited to participate. Thank you. Well, Tom, you're such a flatterer. <laughs> I, I appreciate those kind words, but I'm also glad that you have finally retired and felt like you can afford to be accessible for all of this because you have a wealth of information uh, of, of pieces of this that I don't have. And, uh, and I think it's important. I think we're a great team. Um, we've talked before about getting you out here to help with a class at some point. Uh, we need to discuss that now that uh, now that uh, the pandemic hopefully is sliding to an end here. Um, so we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, Russell's assistance here. I appreciate Daz for, for granting us his usual hour here. Much appreciate that. And of course, most importantly, I appreciate all of you folks who came on board and, and any who watch this later on once it's, uh, it goes, uh, it becomes available on YouTube. Uh, I think that there's a very interesting future ahead of us. I'm sure it will be uneven like every future is, but, uh, but I, you know, of course, want to see remote viewing prosper. And part of prospering is getting the insights that we've already gotten so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel all the time.